a lot of people think that, okay, if I have a faith-based channel, I need to be talking about the Bible. I need to be talking about, you know, a, a sin. I need to be talking about these things. Sure. And yes, they do need to be talked about. But what I love so much about what you've really done in your ecosystem of the entire uh, Justin Koo business is that you've expanded out your reach to be able to influence in the church in a larger capacity because of the skills that you were learning. You couldn't just go and say, hey, can I do this podcast for you? until you had already done Ryan. your own podcast. So maybe you have thought about starting a YouTube channel that is around your faith, or maybe right now you're actually already in a ministry position and you want to diversify. You want to build your influence online. Well, I'm excited because on today's episode of the YouTube Made Simple show, I have my friend Justin here of justinku.com and the YouTube channel, and we're going to be breaking down how he makes money as a faith-based channel. All that's coming up right now. So Justin, I'm so excited for you to be on the YouTube Made Simple show today. We're going to be breaking down uh, how you're making money as a faith-based YouTuber, but not even that, as a content creator in sure. this faith space um, as an influencer. And because of the Think community, I know that we do have a lot of people who want to share their faith online or want to grow their influence because they're already in a faith-based position, mm -hmm. like a pastor, or they're writing books, or they're doing devotionals, or something like that. So I'm excited you're here today, but let's go ahead and break down the story of how you even got started on YouTube sharing your faith. Yeah, so I was in my first year of marriage. I had just moved across the country to start this brand new job. It felt like a dream job at the time. I was uh, invited to teach at a very small Bible college. And at, this, at that time, that season of my life, I was really wanting to step in and to grow in the area of my gifting of, of teaching. I always felt like that's probably something that I, I feel like I could do, but I never really got an invitation to do it. So I'm stepping into this thing. And like, let's be real. A lot of you guys know if you're in ministry that the, the, the pay is not always proportionate to the amount of work that you put in. Um, this was my highest paying job ever in my life at that point, uh, 25 years old. And I was making a grand total of, I think it was $44,000. Yes. Um, so let's, you know, like it, it, it was nice that I could finally pay my bills, but there was not much else that I could do with that type of income. So I actually ended up going onto the internet and trying to figure out what are other ways that I could do this. Um, I had a, had an experience with a student of mine, Michael Troynoski III, uh, a student who came to the school to, because he wanted to serve the Lord and do all these things. It's just, it was awesome story, but the way that he found his way at the school was because of a YouTube video. He decided to become a Christian mm. because of a YouTube video. And that was the first time I ever heard of this idea. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is radical. This is crazy. The internet can be used to really serve people at a deep and meaningful level. And so I was thinking, okay, if that happened for him, how can I utilize the internet in a way that I can spread my message or the message I believe that God has given me and maybe maybe there's a little bit of a dream, turn it into a business. Yeah. And, you know, the context for this moment in my life, I had never owned a camera, really. I had a GoPro, you know, I would do like, a, you know, film my workout sets at the gym or something, you know, something vain like that. But I never took a video editing course, graphic design course, business, like it, none of that. I, I didn't have that context. Um, but I did find a little course, you might have heard of it once, called VRA. <laughs> it was a very little course at the time. Yeah. Uh, as I've now said, it's it, a whole academy. It's yeah. this thing, like there's more to buy now. Mm -hmm. There was only one thing and it was the beta version of the thing and it was a thing that broke many times. Yes. Um, you click a link and it wouldn't work and I'd have to email Heather and be like, hey, um, I think that this thing is... So anyways. All I, fixed now. It, yeah. it, it works yeah. now, you can buy it and it'll be yeah. great. <laughs> um, so I launched into this and it gave me a framework to kind of begin uh, thinking around what does it look like for me to step into the space as someone who has more experience as a communicator mm. in the faith space, but not as a content creator. Mm -hmm. Started making content. Uh, I made a commitment that I would do one piece of content per week, much like we would do in the, in the, in the church space. You do a sermon once a week or something like that. When I would think about my goals in growing the channel, I had to conceptualize it in a way that I would understand. I would think about it like a church plant. Mm. I knew how hard it is to grow a church, to grow a ministry, because I was part of a church plant. I knew that after a year, you know, you're not really expecting massive turnout yet. It's a long-term vision. And so I thought, you know, I, uh, it was New Year's around that time. I was writing goals in my journal. And I remember writing down 250. I felt that if I could work and put in the, uh, the time and energy to do one video per week, 
and at the end of a year, I have a community of 250 people. I'm like, that's better than any church I could ever think of. Mm -hmm. So I wrote down 250. And after I hit period on, on, on that notepad, the Holy Spirit's like, no, dream bigger. Mm. I'm like, oh, I already felt like I was dreaming big. So I doubled the number, 500, okay, whatever. Come to realize that I was dreaming far too small. God wanted me to dream much bigger. Mm. At the end of my first year, 10,000 subscribers. Now we're in somewhere 115,000 subscribers or something along those lines. And, and it just, it blew my mind what could happen when I really leaned into this online space. We talk about how there's, you know, video is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful medium to spread a message right now. And that's what I've seen in my journey. Um, and so, you know, starting off working after hours, you know, I would work my full-time job, come home, spend 20 hours a week or so working on the next piece of content. It was, it was a stressful thing. 10 months into it, finally decided, all right, I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. Ended up resigning my position. I felt like God was leading me to do so. Resigned my position. Told my wife, give me one year. Mm. One year of just dedicated hard work and energy. She would then, you know, foot the bill. And, and like, crazy enough, it worked. <laughs> uh, we're here now five years after the fact. And now, we, with my first kid, my wife is able to take her first year off of, off of job, off, off, off the job because of kind of the business and the ecosystem that we've built through the skills that we've developed in creating content online. So all that to say, is it possible as a faith-based influencer? I think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're ever gonna be the Joe Rogan. You're not gonna be, you know, the Casey Neistat, which is who I was aspiring to be at the time. Like mm -hmm. you're not gonna have, maybe you won't have, maybe you will, I won't speak that over you, you will. Um, <laughs> but I'm not, and I don't think that I ever will be the millions and millions of subscribers, but that doesn't mean that I can't do something meaningful, and it doesn't mean that I can't live a life that's sustainable. Uh, at the same time. So good. And I want to talk about that journey really in getting to, um, you said, you know, you started at the, the most you had ever made 44,000 yeah. <laughs> a year in a, in a great job, you know, doing, doing the work. And, um, but now, I mean, I don't, if you're comfortable with sharing, sure, I mean, sure. you're, you're over six, but you're in six figures now. Yeah still doing great work and doing it online. So I want to break down four um, faith-based channels because there is this con misconception. And I want to talk about this because you dove into trying these different things that yeah. first didn't work. Right. So I want to talk about that. And then I want to talk about how you are actually making an income right now solely off of what you're doing with content. Sure. I would say it's broader than YouTube. Yeah. YouTube is the way, is the in, and it's what helped you get there. But now we've broken it and made it broader. And I want people who are wanting to go down this path to see that there's more than just one way. So talk about at the very beginning. Um, obviously there's ad revenue you can mm -hmm. get from YouTube views, but that's not how you're making no, your living. So no. let's talk about maybe at the beginning sure. and then we'll pivot into what you're doing now. Initially, the belief is ad revenue is the way. Then obviously you, you just watch anyone talk about what ad revenue, ad revenue is. You really, you really quickly realize, unless you're doing like literally millions of views per video, it's not sustainable. Uh, and then you you dive in and you find out VRA is available and VRA gives you a system to work with and a, a, a much better way to, to get sustainability and that's through affiliate marketing, mm -hmm. uh, plugging products on Amazon and things like that. That didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why is because I'm, I'm trying to be very conscious of how uh, Christians are perceived on the internet, mm -hmm. whether rightfully so or not. Um, the televangelist who passes the bucket saying, give me your money, God's gonna bless you, kind of a thing. Like, I never wanted to be that person. I don't wanna perpetuate that stereotype. And so I never wanted to be able to, for someone to have a, a footing to say, oh, that's what they're doing. He's just doing this for the money. So I never wanted to do uh, affiliates also because it's like, what does you know this beauty product have anything to do with what I'm trying to accomplish on the internet? Or what is this, you know, this course? It just, it just felt icky, it felt weird. So mm -hmm. that didn't work either. The, the first, I think, success that I stumbled across was uh, a thing called Patreon, which at the time was not like a, an accepted practice. It is, I think so now. I think mm -hmm. people get it now. That Patreon, if you don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, break it down because mm -hmm. some people don't know what Patreon is yeah. and how it can be. So what is Patreon? Yeah, Patreon is like a goodwill machine. It's a, a way for you to say, hey, I, I see this creator. I love what they're doing and I want to be a part of it. Uh, whether that's like, like I want to support the production of a show, like I can literally weigh in and say, hey, this is kind of a topic that I'm thinking of, or I, I want to nudge the show in one direction or the other. It's a way for you to, to give, to pledge a monthly amount or a, on a per creation amount um, to be able to support a creator. And I felt that that was a way that people would understand what I'm uh, attempting to do. Yeah. In, 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 in our circles, in the faith-based circles, 
tithe or offering, whether you, whatever, whatever your theological stance on it is. The idea of giving monthly to support ministry is a very acceptable practice. It's not sleazy. It's mm-hmm. not salesman-like um, if you present it in the right way. Mm-hmm. And so being able to rally support around the shared mission of what I was att- attempting to accomplish mm-hmm. at the that Christian vlogger stage of my journey, attempting to take uh, the gospel to the internet, to be able to serve young adults specifically, that was something I found that other people were also noticing was uh, an underserved area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so being able to, to find people who who quite literally maybe didn't even watch my content, but because they heard me present at a church or at a conference or they just followed me on social media, they're like, you know what? I see the need for something like this and I know that I can't do it and I know that no one's doing it in the space, yeah. but I'm glad that someone like Justin exists and is doing it. Let me donate. Mm-hmm. That was a massive leap forward and that that got me to my first, let's call it $1,000 a month. Mm-hmm. Like it was it was able to, to, to sustain like pay, buying food and yeah. you know, <laughs> like all the important things. And yeah. it was like, oh, this is really brilliant because this is something I can depend on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not having to go f- uh, search for the next, you know, brand deal. I'm not having to beg and plead the, the algorithm gods to, to, to bless me with a viral video or anything. Like it's something that's dependable. Whether my videos get a dozen views or 12,000 views, views. It wouldn't matter Mm -hmm. because it was something I can count on. Um, In that journey, um, I had some of the most important advice that I could be given when it came to the Patreon economy. Mm -hmm. Um, I had at that time formatted my Patreon so that it was a monthly charge because, uh, you know, the idea is like, oh, it's kind of like church. It's just like you're giving a, a prescribed amount but Patreon has the ability to do a per creation basis versus mm-hmm. a monthly one. And the advice that I was given is to shift as quickly as I could to a per creation basis. Interesting. That was really scary because I'm like, well, what if I get sick or what if I don't, you know, like the, the, the fear was, well, what if I don't deliver enough contents? Like then I'm going to losing money, which I think that that's certainly true. But I think it's easier for your patrons or potential patrons to realize, hey, you know what? I'm supporting a specific episode. Mm-hmm. I'm sp- supporting a very specific show versus just like, I'm just giving money and who knows what happens. Um, the other benefit is, is that you can actually start to work around some of the other elements of your shows. Um, I do like a two or three hour uh, interview for, for most of my, my shows nowadays. Um, but that is not what the content ends up being. Uh, you know, a three hour episode on YouTube would be far too exhausting unless you're Joe Rogan. Um, and so what I end up doing is turning three hours of content into a 45 minute or a one hour episode. Well, there's two hours worth of really fantastic conversation that just dies on the cutting room floor. Well, if you're doing a per content creation, you can do a Patreon charge for the actual edited episode of that uh, uh, interview. Yeah. You can also do an additional charge for the unedited, unscripted, full length, start to finish episode of that uh, or, or version of that interview. As well as number three, what a lot of my viewers were asking for was kind of like my commentary on the episode. What am I learning if I look at the episode a month later and I've had the time to digest it? What am I thinking about? Mm. What is kind of my more un- unfiltered thoughts about it? And really quickly, you could turn one Patreon charge into three, four, if you have more creativity, multiple different things. Um, and so like Patreon quickly became a way for me to make my channel at least at a break even point. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Wow. I'm like soaking in all of the things because that's not a strategy that we currently use, I think. And so just hearing the way that, you know, immediately what came to mind is when there's a good movie, I go and pay for it at the at the um, movie theater and I buy the popcorn and I buy the thing. Like it's the same type of experience. You're just bringing that online and you're going deeper with your audience around the topics that they are interested in, not just some regular, uh, you know, whatever you want to talk about, but very much specific to what they want. So you started with Patreon. So that's one strategy. Talk about then how you've now gone from that break even point to the way that you're making a full-time living off of content creation in the faith-based space. One of the most important things was I had a shift. I had to have a shift in the way I was thinking about what I was doing online. Um, I believed for many years that in order to be a full-time content creator, full-time YouTuber, that the money that I had to make had to be directly from YouTube, mm-hmm. whether that's an ad revenue affiliate. It had to be because of the YouTube videos I had created, and that type of thinking. Uh, it felt like, at least in my experience, I don't know how it's for others, but for me, it. It, I hit a ceiling pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. I had that leap, that initial uh, jump in Patreon to people who supported my mission, but kind of like six months into that journey, like growth 
plateaued hardcore. And, and the reality is, is like three years later, it's more or less within the same general range. Yeah. It's not like blown up. Um, so the number of people who bought the vision and are in it, like they're in it. Like I found my people already, mm -hmm. but I was still trapped in order to produce this content. I had to still work for hours and hours and hours to film, to, to edit, to, to theory craft what the next episode would be. And I found myself working uh, what's the phrase? I, I found myself working in my business in, and not on my business. Uh, on, yeah. In is like you're doing the work. On is like your your vision. You're going right. out there. Yeah. And because I was spending still 10, 15, 20 plus hours every week editing my own videos, like I was limited. Mm -hmm. So I had to do what felt like a major risk. I had to find how do I bring someone on the team and how do I hire and rightfully compensate someone for them working on my content. But that was scary because that's, a third, a half, maybe all of my patronage. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and quite literally, like there's, there are many times where it's, it's all of the money that I would make on Patreon. But what it did is it freed me up in a, a number of different ways. One, I could actually be present as a husband. Mm -hmm. I could actually have time to take care of my health. Uh, and so like life wasn't quite at the red alert level anymore. Mm -hmm. But also, I now had more time to think about like, well, how do I dream of the bigger picture now? if I'm not just working on the next video, I can start to think about like, how do I actually turn what I've learned on this platform for multiple years, the skills that I'm developing to start like leveraging that for other people. Mm -hmm. So I could outsource uh, an entire month's worth of editing and, and, and use that money there. But then I could free myself up to say, okay, how do I trade what I have to be able to drive revenue. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll give you an example. There's a, a, a branch in my church denomination. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. There's a branch in my church that was looking for contents for young adults, for example. I basically pitched them, hey, what would it look like if I did like a 40, I think 40 or 45 episode podcast mm -hmm. on your behalf? Mm -hmm. I know that you need contents for this. Here's, I understand your mission. I understand what you're trying to do. I pitched this project and I think we had some, we, had, we were able to be given a large budget and all I had to do was sit down and interview people like 40 times, which took me, let's call it 25 hours worth yeah. of work. So it would be three or four days worth of work, but that contract would buy me months worth of runway. So now I could spend one week working on their project effectively mm -hmm. and outsource the rest of my work. And I would still have weeks, if not months, to be able to think of the next thing. Mm -hmm. And then, so we did that with a podcast. We've done that with a documentary. We've done that with photography uh, deals. We've done that with kind of like one-off contracting videography, you know, uh, uh, jobs. I'm able to trade one day's worth of work for a week's worth of time mm -hmm. uh, or a month's worth of time or something along those lines. And so now I'm able to, be able to start building a team around myself so that I can actually do this work sustainably. It's so amazing that you even brought that up. And uh, a lot of people think that, okay, if I have a faith-based channel, I need to be talking about the Bible. I need to be talking about, you know, uh, a sin. I need to be talking about these things. Sure. And yes, they do need to be talked about. But what I love so much about what you've really done in your ecosystem of the entire uh, Justin Koo business is that you've expanded out your reach to be able to influence in the church in a larger capacity because of the skills that you were learning you couldn't just go and say, hey, can I do this podcast for you until you had already done right. your own podcast. And yeah. so I, I want you, if you're a faith-based listener, um, and and hear me, if you're not, th use this as same just apply. same principles. Yeah. Uh, just the idea that it doesn't have to be just on YouTube. It doesn't have to be just what you're getting through affiliates or brands or making your own courses or content. It doesn't have to be that. It can be using the skills that you're gaining, the knowledge that you have to be able to go in and even pitch that option mm -hmm. because you know what their vision is, right? You could be using this if you are in mountain, uh, if you're a mountain climbing or you're in, I'm just thinking of things, but there's so <laughs> many things. If you understand the mission of what you're helping with, there's so many opportunities, there's yeah. so many pieces of opportunity. So I want to know, because I know right now, um, you've really grown your influence in the space. You've really grown to be someone who people see as um, someone who understands social media content and understands how to get content out to an audience. There are people that right now are vocationally in ministry, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. And like you said, they're super busy. You're coaching and training these individuals. Mm -hmm. What's some advice you have for them as they are deciding, you know, maybe their church has a YouTube channel. 
which is their Sunday service, mm-hmm. and that's all they're producing right now. What is some advice that you have to someone vocationally who wants to expand past the pulpit? Like, what do mm-hmm. they need to do to be able to grow into being an influencer, influencer sure. online to help to move their mission forward? Well, I, I think specifically in the faith context, we have to be less romantic about the church experience. And, and COVID has, has made that a lot easier mm-hmm. to be less romantic about that, is to realize that, listen, like, Maybe the, the the church model of today continues into the future. Maybe it doesn't, but the need to communicate the gospel is is an evergreen skill. Like it's something that you're always going to be able uh, to, to to find. Like maybe not always find an audience, but like this is something that you should always be doing. And so being able to to realize that hey, you know what? It's okay for you as a minister of the gospel to spend serious time thinking about growing your skills in in the area of content creation, in delivery on video, things like that. Um, you've spent hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours honing in the skill of presenting at a pulpit. Um, and that's served you well, I believe. Um, but the skill is different on camera. Like, you know, because you, you remember that first Zoom weekend that you had to do church and you're just like, this is the most weird and awkward thing in the world. But here's the thing. Every church is feeling that way. Mm-hmm. And if you are able to, uh, to differentiate yourself in the, in the faith space as someone who does command an audience with a microphone and a camera, who's able to speak in these areas, like you're going to be able to serve the body of Christ in, in, in a much grander way than maybe you would have if you only prioritized the physical service. Does this mean that we're completely throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Of course not. Like we need community. We need these, these in real life, personal, you know, you know uh, meeting spaces. But like what we can do on the internet is absolutely incredible. I'll give you an example. So when I was into that Christian vlogger phase, I would create my videos. We do questions and answers, questions asked about the Bible, things like that. And I would have just one line in my bio where, hey, if you want to sign up for Bible studies, here's the link. Mm -hmm. In a calendar year, in 12 months, I wasn't promoting it. There was no audible call to action. Like, hey, click the link. It was just literally like you had to click see more Mm -hmm. in order to even read it. And then you had to click it. I had 2,300 people sign up for personal Bible studies in a 12-month period. Mm -hmm. Like, that's amazing. And and if you're at a church and you don't have yet a a well-thought-out strategy when it comes to your digital missions yet, like, this is the type of opportunity that we're missing out on. Like, this is absolutely crucial. I just started in the last, like, two, three months, like, an experiment on Instagram Mm -hmm. where I'm starting to explore what does it look like to create carousels for the purpose of creating, uh, you know, uh, Bible-based content. And I started to include one of those like community text links. Like, hey, text this word to this number and you'll sign up for my my Saturday morning Bible studies. I regularly have 30 people in on a Zoom type Bible study that I've only been sourced from Instagram. And so what I'm saying here is that the internet is not a second rate mission field. Mm. If anything, it's a first rate mission field because who comes to church if not Christians already? So you're preaching to the choir, which is needed and it's important and I'm, and I'm not knocking it, but the kinds of people who don't go to church but still have the kinds of questions that the scriptures speak to, they're here. And if you can figure out how to show up in a way that's not intrusive, that's not obnoxious, but actually serves them and reaches them and serves them well, like you're going to be doing something that no one else is doing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And I want to go deeper here on uh, the YouTube Made Simple show in doing different types of content creators. I love that we got to start this series in uh, the ministry because there is the misconception that you can't make money if Mm -hmm. you're doing ministry online and uh, you are a testament to that exact thing. So where can people go if they want to go deeper in learning how you're doing this? If they'd like to get coaching from you, what does that look like uh, for what you're doing? Uh, If you're wanting coaching or to book me to speak at a church or conference, Mm justinku.com is the place to go to if you want to see the kind of work that I'm experimenting with and playing around with on YouTube it's Justin Koo Instagram is at jku and I just launched a TikTok Justin Koo as well Um, and maybe this is a way for me to break it for the first time publicly so it forces me out of my like thinking about phase but I'm I'm going to be starting uh, the Justin Koo experiment which will be like a podcast and YouTube channel where it's explicitly exploring what does it look like to be a content creator in the faith space specifically. How do we navigate growing an audience, 
uh, growing revenue, like all the things where we'll have like a private community, like all, all, all of that kind of stuff. It's, it's going to launch hopefully before this episode goes public. <laughs> if not, just follow me on the socials and you'll know when it goes public. Yeah. And as I say, and all these links will be updated down below uh, if you are watching on YouTube or if you're listening on the podcast. Well, I want to thank you again for being here, for being my first of this new series that we oh, just decided really? to start. As awesome. of right now, I was like, we should do a whole series while Let's you were go. talking. So awesome. brand new series about bringing different types of creators and um, and debunking the myths of that. I'm just making this up on the fly, Let's but go. I think it's fun. Sounds great. Um, you're watching the YouTube Made Simple show. Make sure if you are into this type of content that you subscribe. And we have another episode that happens every two weeks. So make sure you are here for that episode. Thank you for being a part of this community. And let me know in the comments section, what was your aha moment or what other type of creators would you like me to bring on this show? And what myths should I debunk on this show. Thank you for being a part of what we're doing here at Think, and we will catch you on the next episode. Are you ready to start or grow your YouTube channel? Do you feel stuck and need help connecting the dots? Join this free web class where you'll learn the step-by-step -step playbook for YouTube success. We've helped thousands of purpose-driven entrepreneurs just like you grow their influence with video. Register today for this exclusive training at thinkmasterclass.com.